Oh, I go where I please. I will continue to go into women's restrooms, women's locker rooms, women's spaces, because I am a woman, whether you like it or not. Some see me as the woman of the year. Some people don't see me as a woman at all. I know. I hate her. Oh, hi there. Welcome back to my trash podcast. So we are leaving the traumatic events of last week in last week. Check my main channel if you uh, are just a podcast subscriber. You'll be entertained. But, you know, it's now back to our regularly scheduled programming, which is... Hi. Right there. Uh, As trash as it is, right? So... (laughs) I just want to sit here and run my mouth, what I'm good at. So let's just run that mouth. So (laughs) white women are paying thousands of dollars. (laughs) All right, y'all know that weirdo mood is just there from the start. Usually it starts setting in around the woke TikTok segment. Today it's just right up front. White women are paying thousands of dollars to confront their racist beliefs over dinner. Race to dinner has seen a significant jump in interest from white people I almost said people specifically, definitely only white people who say they want to dismantle their own racist beliefs. Now, it's not just that this exists because I've actually heard of this. It is a dinner that is hosted by minority women and white women sign up and pay a ton of money, a couple G's, right, to sit and talk to these women of color and be schooled about how they're racist. So it sounds demented on its face, but wait till you watch the video. You didn't say yours. What? And I say the exact same thing to my white girlfriend who says the same exact thing. I don't care if you talk to everybody like that. Straight up. White supremacy. Okay. So first of all, I'm not even mad at the people who are running this dinner, right? In a way, I mean, they're sick, right? They're sick bitches, but... I respect the fact that they're like, let me figure out a way to get paid to be a sick bitch. (laughs) Let me make money off of it, right? Let me flex that capitalist muscle. And as a capitalist. And you know what? In some ways, as someone who also makes a living off being a sick bitch publicly. (laughs) I respect it in a really bizarre but very real way. And however you're going to make money in this world is how you make money, but... I will not fall for the idea that this is even remotely something serious or productive for anyone. It's just, I can't. Miss Girl, whatever, clearly a Miss Karen or a Miss Barbara, Miss Barbara Jean, whatever her name is, she really is so bored. She is so unfulfilled at home that she signed up for this hostage situation. This was a very this this is a very demented struggle session clearly and this is clearly a narcissist who is charging people to project that inner desire to abuse people mentally like this is just gross and then instantly and you see how weak their arguments are right because even Barbara Jean who is on their side said well you know I do speak that way to everyone and she responds with I don't care if that's how you speak to everyone after trying to make it seem as though that's specifically how she's talking to her because she's a person of color. Like, do do you guys get what I'm saying? It's like the entire point is making Barbara Jean aware of how she talks to women of color, right? She just immediately finds some way to argue back saying, I don't care if you talk to everyone like that. But isn't that why she's there? That she's trying to learn how she speaks to people of color might be an issue? Isn't that proof right there that you're looking for malice and ill intent where it just isn't, right? So there's another one, let's watch this one. I'm a racist and you can be a really good person and still be racist. Every white person is is racist. My mother is a racist. You just perfectly laid out the issue, right? The fact that you can say, (laughs) every white person in America is racist, you can still be a good person and be racist. No. That's not how racism works. If you have that demon inside of you that makes you see people of other races as beneath you, or you have a lack of ability to treat people with respect and dignity, regardless of the shade of their skin or their country of origin, like that is 
the definition of not being a good person. So the fact that y'all have to stretch the definition to include good people shows how hard you're reaching here. Does that make sense? I feel like I'm not crazy for the way I'm saying this or the way I understand this. It's like on a deeply like intrinsic level, I believe that being racist makes you a bad person in the same way that hating anyone makes you a bad person. So it shows how irrational these people's ideology is that they have to stretch it to include people that are not good people. And first of all, for you to put your mom on blast on camera, talking about my mom is a racist as well as me, considering you're using the word racist, objectively incorrect and wildly delusionally, I'm willing to bet your mom isn't a racist. And therefore I would say, maybe not put her on blast like that. Like you're just throwing that word around, aren't you Susie? We have this supply and demand issue, right, of hatred in the country. We have a such a low supply of it at this point, at least in terms of based on things like skin color, gender, et cetera, that it's not reaching the demand. Like it's not. And instead of viewing that as a good thing, it's very telling that you got to get up on camera and abuse these very nice ladies who are clearly going through some kind of abuse themselves for her to sit up on camera and say, I am a racist. My mom is a racist with a smile as if that's not something sick. As if you're not letting your sick bitch energy out in a way that if anyone loved you, they wouldn't let you let that out. Especially not with a camera. That's what I always am so gagged about when it comes to people who let this type of just like deranged behavior out on camera is that there's a camera. Right? So first of all, any type of behavior you that you engage with in real life is always turned down a little bit on camera. If you're not someone who's like a personality who has to actually turn it up a little bit to be on camera. People like her, a camera turns on. That's probably the first time she's had that big old, you know, Sony whatever the hell up in her face talking about telling your thoughts, right? She's never seen a camera that professional looking. She is gagged. And yet and still, even in being gagged and clearly somewhat camera shy as everyone has an instinct to be for the first time, she is just with a grin so ready to jump into this deranged behavior so you know it's 20 times worse when the camera's off is what i'm saying it's entertaining but we need we need to catch up to speed on how to actually help these minorities that all these activists are purporting to help you know you see it spread out obviously with the trans stuff i was thinking about it that jubilee debate where i was in that italian mob warehouse hit room like the room where they, people get whacked where I was met with Pennywise and Bigfoot, that room, that fever dream that wasn't a fever dream, that fever dream that I almost thought was a fever dream in between filming it and putting it out. And I literally almost thought, I'm not kidding. Did I imagine going through that? Even as I was doing posts about it to you guys and telling you what to expect, I was like, what if I had some sort of psychotic break? Imagined I was in that warehouse with Pennywise and Bigfoot and that that is such a crazy thing for it to first of all have been Pennywise and Bigfoot that I had to imagined it I had to have imagined it and now I'm telling my audience about it and when this never drops I'm gonna look crazy <laughs> I almost had that thought so what was I talking about we we're talking about that dinner <laughs> oh activists who are really not activists you saw it clear as day on that jubilee debate right like the comments are full of people being like, hi, I'm a conservative and I actually disowned my trans sibling until I found Blair's channel. She's actually doing real trans activism without having to have that annoying phrase, trans activist attached to it just by being a human. And the liberals who are like, you know, I'm a liberal and I hate Blair White. She's the worst. But y'all are actually setting trans rights back. But yet and still, those are the hoes that are going to be at the White House. Those are the hoes that are going to be, you know, on Pink News talking about these are the people pushing forward trans rights. It's like, that's how you know it's sick and wrong. But the point is it extends to everything. So it extends to, it extends to women like this who are running these classes and just setting up hostage situations for women and pretending that that's for the benefit of people of a racial minority. 
Y'all are some sick bitches. And as a sick bitch, I respect it. But you're also going to hell for that. So Dylan Mulvaney <laughs> accepts Woman of the Year Award with beautiful message for trans youth. Now listen, a lot of y'all got a hate boner for Dylan Mulvaney, and I get it. Because a lot of that behavior is just, is there a word beyond cringe, right? I just, and then in terms of setting things back, I mean, crazy play, right? <laughs> crazy play Dylan Mulvaney too in the middle of the, it was so crazy. Back in the spring, I swear to God, if there ever was a moment where like, we really were on the glimpse of like, or on the on the edge of like some real trans rights being rolled back was like, the same month that Dylan Mulvaney was on the Bud Light can and that Nashville sh came running through that kid's school, for that to happen simultaneously, I mean, wow. And for, I was actually feeling the heat during that, right? I was actually like, oh, there's some hate coming through. And I'm feeling it. <laughs> My producer's like laughing. I would have rejected that Bud Light offer just on the basis of maybe not right now. Now, I'm not, I'm not one of these people who is looking at an award, even if it is so cringefully and inaccurately titled, um, to just be like raging about it, right? Like, I'm not like, oh my God, the woman of the year, because it's not as if Dylan got a Nobel Peace Prize. So like, we should be aware of that. But it is just these little things that build up to this resentment towards trans people and they are so easily avoidable like making a trans woman of the year award i say that as someone who we rejected for that each and every year i don't even care give the trans woman award to any of these dementia toes you can even give it to blossom i would rather you do that than give the woman of the year award to any trans woman and just give people the reason to be like so these aren't just men erasing women and getting awards that would be given to women. Cause it says woman of the year award, right? And this is why I always say, never am I gonna be demented or strange or terminally online enough to correct a person in real life who doesn't know I'm trans or even does know I'm trans and just refers to me as a woman without that trans prefix. However, when we're talking you know, politically, when we're talking biologically, when we're talking titles on awards and we're being very specific and technical, you gotta include that trans babe. Because there's some important context behind it, babe. A whole lot less important context between a person in real life being like, oh, who's that woman? That's my friend Blair. Who needs to say trans for that, right? However, this, when we're titling awards, which are usually very specific, right? Like, you'll get an award at the VMAs that's like, best new up-and-coming director slash cinematographer from the UK who also does music videos award. Like they break it down. So we can break it down for the trans woman year of the award when there is this much social flame -er <laughs> around the word trans. I thought I wasn't gonna rage about it and it's actually making me kind of mad because it's such an easy thing to avoid, right? Very easily avoidable. Woman of the year award supported by Virgin Atlantic goes to Dylan Mulvaney! Hello, London! I am so honored to be here with you all tonight. And, you know, some see me as the woman of the year, some see me as a woman of a year and some change, as I only publicly came out online 560 days ago. And some people don't see me as a woman at all. I know, which is why receiving this honor from a queer publication like Attitude means so much more to me. Because here's what I've realized. You ready? Okay. So, no matter how hard I try, or what I wear, or what I say, or what surgeries I get, I will never reach an acceptable version of womanhood by those hateful people's standards. But as long as I have the queer community that sees me for my truth, I'm gonna be okay. Okay, so I kind of want to psychoanalyze this video. There's so many psychological cues to pick up. The first one is, you know, Dylan saying, there are some people that don't see me as a woman. 
frowning face, disapproving. First of all, that is true. And that's step one. I'm, I'm glad that you're announcing that you know this now because this is something that every trans woman knows that you could do anything and there is always going to be people that don't see you that way. The bigger question and the step two to find within your soul and your spirit, and I'm not trying to be funny. This is serious. Serious as in like I'm being a truthful here. Step two, you really need to unpack why you need them or want them to view you that way and why anyone's approval around you other than you, yourself, and God and maybe one or two select humans on this planet aside from that. Think about you. Because what's really telling is that the reason I get called self-hating as a trans person so often is because they are convinced that I need conservatives or, or people that are not trans to like me, accept me, and see me as a woman. Therefore, I put other ones down. That's the narrative, right? The, the stuck-on stupid simpleton narrative of what Blair White does and why she does it. That's the depths of their psychoanalysis. But what really is the truth, right, is that I care so little about anyone viewing me as a man and a woman that I can sit up on camera and do something that will not cause me a mental breakdown like so many of them. I'm a man. The simple fact that I can say that and not burst into tears or feel like I just said the N-word level, you know, transgression on camera, because that's how they treat that. Where's the self-hating? Y'all can't utter that phrase, and I'm the one that's self-hating. No, it's the opposite. So, so for Dylan to say, you know, and clearly is upset that there are some people that do not view Dylan as as a, as a woman, and then and then the next step thing is to say, but as long as I have the queer community, you shouldn't need them either. And that's how you end up with that toxic collectivism that leads people to holding very stupid political positions from within the LGBT community because they have convinced themselves that the entirety of the outside world hates them, which is never true. And that, you know, the entirety of the outside world does not meet their standards for how they must think. That's really the core of it. That's how you end up with all these radical political positions that take our community back because you feel like you have to say them because you need that validation from that queer community no matter what. It actually makes me sad because I feel like the reason why I do have within me this disregard for how other people view me, not like fully, right? It's not as if I have no shame. I'm, we're not, we don't want to be like fully on one end of the spectrum here, but in terms of like how people see me being trans, genuinely, for as obsessed as people say I am with the word passable, a word that I actually actively reject using or make an effort not to use because I know how obsessed people are with that word. And I know that coming out of my mouth, people just take it all the wrong way, right? As obsessed as people think I am with passing, I genuinely do not walk through the world caring about a single person who is observing me in the wild or interacting with me, knowing if I'm trans or not. Because number one, it's my business. Number two, what's the point? I'm a public figure. Like, there could be a million reasons why you're clocking me right now. It could be because you know me online, because you're noticing these hands, these man hands, because my voice might have a little bit of a fucking, I don't, I don't know, any reason, right? I don't care. <laughs> because I love myself. That thing that they claim I actually don't do, the opposite, right? They say, Blair White hates yourself. It's really actually evident who hates themselves. That wasn't a statement about Dylan. That was a statement about all y'all who say that about me. But um, the thing about Dylan here is the applause is very shallow from the audience, which is actually disturbing, right? Not shallow in the sense that you can hear it and hear that it's shallow, knowing that it is. Because what I learned about L.A., and that whole scene, right, is that, and, and the Wokies that live there, is that they actually don't view you as a woman. Those lived out queer community Wokies, they don't. They see you as a pet. They see you as a pretty gay boy. They see you as funny, a character. How do I know that? I say that they don't believe that you are a woman because I've experienced that. In LA, the way everyone in LA treated me was never like a woman. Like people who knew that I who I was and like were around me partying, my friends, my social circles, never. Those libs never thought I was a woman. 
They thought I was a trans woman. They thought I was a tranny. But I was never treated like a woman. Interestingly, the first time in my life since post-transition I ever have been treated like a woman was moving here to Texas. And these very traditional country people, conservatives who have never met a trans person in their life, each and every single one of them default into treating me like a woman because they've never done anything different. They treat you like a trans person, Dylan, and they see you that way because that's who they are obsessed with being around. That's who they are, their friend circles. They don't see you as a woman. So the only solution is to not give a fuck how anyone sees you because only you know who you really are right anyways. And on another level, if you want to go deeper, spiritually, psychologically, mentally, I'm knowing myself and learning about myself more and more each and every year, each and every month. So you start at having respect and love for yourself that you don't need that validation. And from there, you build on self-learning. You build on learning what you really are because you're going to learn you're a different person every year if you're really someone who's growing and you're really someone who is assessing why they do certain things and trying to become more self-aware, which means you're going to have to learn that self-love each and every time because you're having to new, learn a new person because we're always changing. No, you start at self-love and then you learn who you really are over time. And self-love is saying, I'm here. And all the things that y'all add on to that, which is, and I'm a woman and everyone has to respect that. And these are my pronouns and you have to respect me. No, none of that comes into, I'm here. Everything else should be unspoken. I don't give a fuck who views me any type of way. Oh, you hate Blair White because online people said she's an evil conservative Republican Nazi. You can have that opinion. You can be very resistant to interacting with me if you see me out in these streets because of that, right? You can be one of these people who are trans women and women and Blair White is a woman, period. You can say that. I'm going to disagree with you on a technical level. Thanks for the love, I guess. I'm, you're, I'm perceiving that you're trying to give me love. I don't necessarily see that as love, but thanks, I guess. Because lying to me isn't love, right? <laughs> or you can be these people on the right who are like, Blair's cool, but I'll always say he, and then they meet me in person and never do that once, right? So you can be any of those people. None of your views of me falls into my view of myself ever. That comes from me. And it doesn't extend to anyone else. Because what you're really saying here is without that queer community, at least to view you how you think they view you, then what? It's just you, right? And it's just you going to bed at night. You laying your head down on that pillow and you got to love you. Period. Moving on. What is the pandemic skip? Women on TikTok discuss losing years to COVID. Okay, friends, we have to talk about the great pandemic skip. If you, like me and this author, are just coming to terms with the crazy time warp that we have been living through over the past couple of years, then you're not alone. Y'all know. I'm that hoe that keeps talking about COVID because on a human level, it's not even about COVID anymore. On a human level, there's so much to analyze about us as a species from that entire thing, regardless of where you fall on the spectrum of how you viewed it, regardless of where you live, because where everyone lived, you experienced it differently. So the pandemic skip is this phrase for, pe for people on TikTok who are going on and they're talking about, does anyone know why I seem to have memory loss from 2020 until now? Talking about, does anyone feel like they aged from 26 to 29 in a heartbeat and they don't even remember like those other years? I'm not annoyed by it. I'm actually very saddened by it because as someone who, you know, has over the years unpacked a lot of trauma that I've been through in my life as a child, I know that the hallmark of trauma is memory loss. The hallmark of trauma is that your brain is forced to remember it and view it in a way that is heavily obscured to hide. It's a survival mechanism because the pain of it is actually too much for you to go on and like be a functioning person with like your brain still working. 
That's brain trauma. So to the average person who's never, and I am thankful for the fact that they have never experienced trauma in their life, at least to that extent, I'm glad that they are actually kind of blindsided by it in a way because it means that at least you had a good life, right? I don't want everyone to know what trauma feels like. I would rather no one does, right? But it's amazing that I absolutely feel in my spirit that the entire planet went through an insane collective trauma during those years. And... That's the reason why overnight it seems like no one's talked about it anymore. Which is why I make a conscious effort all of the time on every podcast I go on to mention it because it, it bleeds into so many politics I have to talk about regardless anyways, right? Like, you know, the size of government, right? Like lockdowns, you know, medical freedom, vaccines, like all of that stuff is stuff I have to talk about anyways. But I'm always like, it's insane actually how no one talks about it anymore. Even people who while it was happening were quite awake to the government overreach, to what was really going down. They dropped it like a hot biscuit. The other part about trauma is that you don't wanna talk about shit. Your brain doesn't even allow you to like open up to talking about it because it's too painful. So that's why I'll go on podcasts, political podcasts, bring up COVID on a round table and everyone acts like I said something off topic while talking about government, the size of government and tyranny and freedom. As if it's not the biggest example in our lifetimes of a gauge on how we feel about the size of government and freedom and tyranny. Can't think of a more accurate thing to bring up. And there's also this interesting thing if you fall more on the side of there were a lot of lies and deceptions told to us during COVID, which I'm on that side, right? It's interesting how there is like a time period for which saying that is so taboo I mean, you literally notice it in the moment when it was happening during COVID. I was, I was trying to speak out on all the lies and all the deception that I so clearly saw, you know, including the articles that the virus can't get you if you're protesting. But, the, but it's like when it was right-wing protests against the lockdowns for the virus, it could get you. And as if, like, right? Virus can't spread outside now because... Our people are doing something politically convenient for us. That kind of blatant, you know, gaslighting, manipulation. I was always speaking out on that when it, hap when it was happening in the moment. So, and it was very taboo. Even people that I expected to have a brain to see through that were like, but you're killing grandmas, Blair. So you see that, but, you know, now after even, there's a window of time where you just kind of can't talk about it still. Like I've been seeing videos on like 9-11 pop up on my feed that are just so blatantly like, all right, let's unpack all those lies. And it's like, oh, 20 year, 22 years later, let's unpack all the lies. But in the meantime, let's take a big dump on every person trying to unpack those lies when they're smart enough to see it in person or not weak enough to be bullied into not talking about it when they see it in the moment, right? Because that's the other thing. There are a lot of people who see these deceptions but are so easily bullied and beaten down by their peers and just want to not rock the boat or be canceled or whatever that in the moment they can't say it, even if they're smart enough to pick up on it to appease the feelings of the people who are too dumb to pick up on it. So there's layers to it. Let's unpack the lies of 9-11. In 2023? Okay. I mean, I'm down to do it. So glad to have this conversation, but I would be amiss to say, not to say, that that conversation should have probably happened, I'll give it 2002 even, right? So with, you know, a lot of the lies about, you know, everything that happened in COVID, and we're talking even if I am being inclusive, even to y'all who were more scared of the virus than what was happening with the world on a psychological level on a freedom versus tyranny level i mean there's no comparison to the level of fear for me i know where i stand which is that was the problem way more than the virus with the 99 point something percent survival rate that's where i stand but you know how long until we can just talk about that how long until everyone just wakes up from the trauma and says, you know what, we should probably have a conversation about if the government is allowed to lock us in our houses. 
Oh, all y'all freedom fighters. And I'm talking left and right. Hi. A lot of these freedom fighters let that go and have not even attempted to put any laws in place to not let that go, to reduce the size of government. And they saw the most egregious example of ballooning up that government size, overreaching that long government arm into the personal lives of each and every citizen, each and every citizen. And they haven't tried to do anything after that. So even if they failed to fight it in the moment, which they did, obviously, you would think that they'd be like, all right, lost the battle, but let's win the war now and make sure it doesn't happen again. Nope. Nope. We're not even talking about it. And in fact, when Blair White brings it up on a right wing podcast, all of them not mentioning it, not specifying here, no one wants to talk about it. Trauma. And so I'm including them on the right, those freedom fighters. And the leftists who want to talk about oppression, but allows the government to oppress them to the extent that they must lock themselves in their homes, not work, can't feed your kids. You're going to put a needle in your arm. You're going to put a few actually whenever we say to do it again. We'll, we'll let you know when. We don't even really know right now, but we'll let you know when. And you're going to do it. And if you don't do it, you're not allowed to go to work, to apply for college, to enter any of these establishments. We're going to maybe let you still go in the grocery store, but you better be double masked. And we're going to psychologically torture people so heavily that we don't actually even have to make it a full law. It's a mandate, so you still got to obey it because we will have some consequences. But we're going to do our big one in flex that we don't have to make even a law. You're going to get harassed so much by how much we're, psych we're torturing people mentally that they'll actually come for you. The second you step in that grocery store, they'll look at you like you're Bin Laden. I'm doing the most, but it's fine. Um, moving on. And now it's time for the reacting to woke TikTok segment of the Blair White Project podcast. So one of two things may happen here. Considering I experienced these people in real life now in that warehouse, that mob hit bust warehouse with Pennywise and Bigfoot, that fever dream. You know, considering I experienced in real life, I was thinking I may either be so actually traumatized by having to watch these people again, be back at it with the woke TikToks, or I may be way more able to handle it than ever. So let me know what you think at the end, how I handled it. Rate me, put a, put a, put a little score in the comments. Well, I go where I please. I will continue to go into women's restrooms, women's locker rooms, women's spaces, because I am a woman, whether you like it or not. And there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing Fox News can do about it. Ollie London, uh, Ben Shapiro, uh, Stephen Hilton, uh, Tim Pool. So here's the thing. First of all, we need to start talking about how, since y'all want to force this word passing on me, let's talk about it, babe. Since y'all want to imagine all the times Blair's went on about passing, even though I actively avoid the word we're going to use it now. We're going to have some real talk now. So because you pulled it out of me, let's stick our heads up, sit up straight, and listen in a way that is very adult-like. Right? Passing is a lot more than looks. In fact, looks are often at the bottom of the totem pole. You know how y'all talk about how I just bash everyone's looks in regards to passing? When, if you really know the situation about passing, looks actually fall very low on that list. It's about energy. It's about aggression level. It's about that spirit. And when you have this male aggression in you to, as he's talking, put his, he's, he's lunging at the camera. Did y'all see that? He's like, I go where I please and no one can stop me. Ollie London, Ben Shapiro. It's like, you're coming at, first of all, a bunch, a list of men, like a man, while also saying, I'm a woman. I'll go wherever I want. Ben Shapiro, I'll go in the bathroom. Huh. I mean, if that's the demeanor you walk in that bathroom with, I, it's not a far 
off imagination in my head of why women are reacting with a, at least a side eye, right? At least a little, who? Because I would. Like, that's the, other, that's the other conversation. Like, if you're really like a trans woman and you got that, I'm very aggressive on camera. I'm very like, bold, but in real life, it's like I do have a very sort of like, I'm to myself, not submissive, but very like light, you know what I mean? And I'm not like, I'm going in this room. <laughs> you know what I mean? But so that even if I came across this person trying to bust up in the room, I'd be like, oh, my, my, my safety is very much in jeopardy. But really, it is so much more than looks. And that's why it's also a double stupid thing when people talk about how I'm going on about passing despite never using the word. Because even if I were, how I really, really feel about passing is that looks is low on the bottom totem pole of, of what matters and what builds into that. Example. On the Jubilee debate, um, Jessica, who is one of the trans conservatives, you know, she talks about how she has self-awareness and she feels like she doesn't necessarily pass, but that she doesn't go to the women's restroom out of respect for them. First of all, that's amazing self-awareness and that's also very commendable. People who put other people before them, that's just a good person in general, right? And the comments are full of people, of women. No, not of people, of women. The comments are full of women. In fact, I saw a few top comments that were like, Jessica, you can come in the women's bathroom anytime you want because you clearly are a good person and you respect women. So that's that fact that it's about energy, right? The looks matter too. We're not disregarding it. And it's assessing a threat, which is what women actually do all of the time. Women are actually, this is one of the things that I have learned. I'm not learning any of the, you know, biological stuff in terms of periods or pregnancy or, you know, so many other things that only biological women will go through. But one of the things that I learned about being perceived as a woman in the world, once I started walking these streets and people saw in their head a woman, I realized how every day women are doing some level of threat analysis on the, on the men around them and no one is immune to it. If, when women walk into rooms with men, they are aware of what men are in the room, you know, on a vibe level and they, it, they assess who's a threat, who's not, who is looking at me with sexual eyes, who's looking at me with a different type of eyes. It's just what they do. I definitely started doing it the moment the world started perceiving me as a woman because it is palpable that moment. Like I felt it. I knew it. I was like, oh, this is the shift. This is the shift. Now I'm actually being treated like a woman by society. And with it comes a certain vulnerability. Is it the same level of vulnerability of women, my exact, you know, size, height, weight, but without these man hands <laughs> to defend themselves a little bit better? No, it's not the same level of threat. However, it's definitely a threat. I'm 5'5", 125 pounds, like men are a threat to me. And I have to be, I have to make assessments based on who is a threat and how big of a threat every room I go in when it comes to men. Who's trying to fuck me? Who's trying to, you know, is disgusted by me? Who likes me? Who's, who wants something else? It's like a thing. You got to remember women have men that come up to them, strangers, to hit on them. And I'm not putting down men who... Also, that other side of the coin, have that courage to approach women because I actually find that very honorable that you are willing to take it old school like that and approach someone in person. And I think that any woman with her salt is always going to respond with respect if you come at her with respect in that scenario, right? That's not what I'm talking about when it's a mutual, like this is a respectable moment between a male and a female and it's a courting thing. It's like a, it's a mating thing. It's like animalistic. What I am talking about is how women have creepy men who don't come up to them with good intentions all of the time, regardless of how attractive they are. So that builds a level of distrust of men in any space. So they are doing these assessments of threat levels. And for you, sir, your threat level's 10. It's 10. Right? So since, again... Blair only cares about passing, a word she doesn't use, but we're going to say it anyways. We'll start with the looks then. Yeah, you look 100% like a man. Not even 99, right? Like that's just every characteristic on screen is man. But to double that and add to it with that energy is the other part that's way bigger actually. 
Because many women, even if they see you making a decent effort, even if they clock that you're trans, but they see you that you're clearly making an effort and clearly have an energy that goes with the look you're trying to have at least and not walking into bathrooms like this Ben Shapiro, then that's a different story. You're a threat. I see you as a threat. And I have balls. All right, so this is a non-binary activist complaining about the law in Florida that gives a death penalty for convicted child rapists. Of all things to have an issue with, right? Hi, so there have been some interesting bills coming out of Florida this week, such as the multiple proposals that would allow the death penalty for anyone who sexually batters a child under the age of 12, which was approved unanimously, or the vote to allow the death penalty on a split jury. Now you might be thinking, you know, people who harm children deserve the worst penalties in the world, and sure, but I want us to think about how we keep having these scares focused around minorities about how we are going to harm the children, we are going to be predators, we are going to be etc. Giving the government the right to murder just means they have to redefine who deserves murder before you are on that list, before we are on that list. You know, I really don't know who could possibly be upset about a law punishing child let me let me dial back what I was gonna say other than someone who has some sort of bad intent that's what I'm gonna say I am elevating in the way I talk about these people I'm being the kindest version of Blair why you think that LGBT people are the priority to frame everything through, by the way. I mean, wow. Like I saw some, some person or some article that was like, I'm conflicted on how to view the Israel versus Palestine conflict because is you, I can get my hormones in Israel, but Palestine, it's like, hold on. So you're viewing who you support in that conflict based on anything to do with trans, but also an estrogen prescription? That's demented. So why you're viewing how society figures out how to punish child through the LGBT lens is demented. You're fine if you're not kids, right? Now, I also have nuanced opinions about the death penalty. I, I try so hard to support it in terms of what it is, but I also am aware how many people, you know, end up on death row. They shouldn't be. But what you should be fighting against is the things within our community that make us look like we're a threat to children rather than doing the afterthought, which is like, hey, so we've allowed a lot of pro-pedo commentary and dialogues and political aim within this community. But, you know, now that people are really fighting back against child abuse, that might not have been the best lane to lean into. Yeah, probably not. Probably not. Um, also, the government doesn't have to redefine a child abuse. They either find you guilty of the crime or they don't, right? Things I hate about America after spending lots of time overseas, part one. This one might piss people off, but the patriotism. A flag on every single street is just simply unnecessary. American flag hats, the American apparel, just it's everything. You know what I'm talking about. We push this American agenda on everyone who lives here so hard. And when we go to other countries, it's just not pushed that hard. When you go other countries, they just, they rep their country without being literally annoying about it. So, choice word, annoying, right? It's kind of like if I insulted someone by being like, can you not be such a brunette? I am a brunette, you are annoying. So at that point, it's just projection. Um, you keep making these statements separating the US from other countries and I understand why you do it because we're the best country in the fucking world. But we're also objectively, even if you hate America, you know that we're like, on the list of like the most powerful countries in the world. You can have the argument now is like, is China ahead, is the US ahead, is Russia, whatever, right? But we're making that top three regardless. So maybe the difference between us and these countries that don't rep themselves and don't have that self-love <laughs> 
is that that actually plays into why they're not on that most powerful list. One of the most toxic things that also no one talks about is the fact that the American flag has become a symbol of the right. I hate it, actually. It's one of the most annoying and depressing things to come out of like modern politics, which is that when you see an American flag in someone's bio, you are automatically assuming and almost always correct that that person is on the right in some fashion and that you will actively see people on the left you know, just bashing America and pretending as if we are Saudi Arabia or some shit, you know, just being very hyperbolic and putting down our country. And it's like, I understand that cringe level of like patriotism because I engage in it. I love posting like 4th of July posts and like America, we're white and blue and all that, right? I like doing that and I understand that it's cringe. So when people say it's cringe, I don't even argue because I'm like, yeah, I know. I am engaging in cringe, babe. But <laughs> the other part of it is like, the real level of patriotism, which is actually just not having this hatred towards the place we live that is unwarranted, even that is seen as cringe. And that's bad. That keeps us so not cohesive and so plays a part into why we are so divided today on a literal level. It's like the American flag does not just belong to Blair White when she's being cringe. It belongs to every cringe person on the left who hates Blair White. It belongs to all of y'all and me. Even if you have a different vision of where we're headed or where we should be headed, that flag is still yours. And I don't know. It's like, this is what you're choosing to bitch about today on TikTok? Do you want to know the trans version of the Roman Empire? It's the fact that we are in stage seven of genocide in America for trans people. I hate her. Blair, that's a strong word. Okay, let me break it down. Why? So this is another one of those examples of the trans activist who is supposedly pushing us in the right direction while gaslighting, terrifying, and lying to a group of people that is lied to that we are murdered at disproportionate rates that is factually incorrect. Two people that are already suffering from mental health issues of various forms. And you have them in a constant state of fear. You and the media who runs with this and so easily throws out the word genocide. How dare you use that, first of all, for people who have actually been victims of that, right? There are still people alive today that survived the Holocaust and other forms of genocide or, that have happened. So that's pretty disgusting, right? You're pretty nasty for that. Wild for you to throw that out so easily all in the pursuit of fear-mongering fear a group of people that already suffer from mental health issues. So actually, you're a crazy abuser. You're a crazy abuser. A psychopath who is downplaying genocide to terrorize a group of people struggling with mental health issues. I mean, if anyone could break down what I'm doing and describe it in such horrific words, I mean, you're the devil. That is straight demonic, demon shit, right? I've, I hope I'm not being too dramatic with that. I mean, I'm very into just like deeply looking at what, what all these people are doing lately because it can be broken down like that. It can. One plus one equals two. You are a bad person for waking up, rubbing the crust out of your eyes, putting that phone in your face and saying, that's what I'm doing today. I'm going to lie and terrify this group of people that I am also lying that I am supporting and trying to help and push forward by making us feel like there is an expiration date on our lives. Because who is going to want to live a prosperous life where they're going after their dreams, trying to meet their goals, trying to live a healthy, productive life when they think they're on stage seven of a genocide? Because Little Miss Trans Appropriator said so. Not because there are actually numbers backing that up, right? And they just, they just know exactly when to invoke that fear-mongering and use Jewish people. Whenever they want to use that word Hitler to describe the most benign <laughs> Republican they encounter, they will use that, they will use that Nazi word, right? Because let's not forget, George Bush was a Nazi, Mitt Romney was a Nazi, who is now a cucked out dem. You know, John McCain was a Nazi. And then they want us to believe that Trump was actually the Nazi. Was he was actually Hitler? We, 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 we were we were kind of joking every other time. This one is okay. So that's the 
psychopath who cried Hitler. Next, hundreds of humans who identify as dogs gather at a Berlin train station to advocate for the rights of people who identify as dogs. The event was organized by a group called Canine Beings. You know, it's moments like these that I am ready to retire very early. It's really too much, right? It's too much for any person to observe, to witness. You know, that sidewalk still has that smell. You know that despite this video perhaps even being recorded a year ago, who knows, that stench is still there. It didn't leave. I mean, they identify as dogs. So even setting aside the, there's no way they don't smell just on a basic hygiene, basic self-love level. You know, they're nasty, stinky bitches. But because they identify as dogs, you know they're just dropping a deuce wherever they want like a dog does, right? I'm done. I got misgendered at work on Wednesday um, by someone that has been corrected before and it just hit me hard. I was three hours into my um, long shift. I don't even remember how long it was, maybe eight hours, my eight hour shift. Um, I immediately was like, no, I need to leave. So I left, I went home. Um, and since then I have been spiraling, which is not a fun thing to be dealing with when you are a broke person living in New York City and need to pay rent. So I'm getting ready to go to work right now, go to my other job. Um, I called out last night and I'm having to talk myself into showing up today. How broke can you be if you just have this choice to wake up every day, whether or not you want to roll up to work? It's just your choice, huh? I left work out of nowhere because someone said a word I didn't like, and then the next day I called in, and then today I'm really deciding, like, should I go to work or not? You can't be that broke. And notice how, <laughs> first of all, when she said, so I got misgendered at work today, and ever since then, I have been spiraling. Spiraling. She rewinded if you need to. She smiled. Spiraling. Again, because I'm psychoanalyzing these people from now on, that's the real her. She's smiling about it because she could not be more lit emotionally in a positive direction. That she had something happen that she is able to hop up on TikTok and make a video about, first of all, get that content, that clout, and then also have people feel bad for her and cry for her and tell her she's such a strong warrior for going to work, you know, looking the way she does. And there's no one on the planet who would look at you and say anything other than she. Blair is talking about not passing again. Not a word I used. I'm just talking about reality. If I looked like Joe Jonas, despite being just as internally trans as I am, right? That gender dysphoria, that condition, whatever. Take everything inside my brain, heart, and mind. Put it in Joe Jonas's body. In what world would I have a even remotely rational reason to expect anyone to call me anything but he? That's that realism that y'all need to learn about. That's not me judging who passes and who doesn't. That's that's just a black and white situation, right? No nuance, right? You have a woman in a camera literally engaging in like a, a feminine thing. She's like looking in the mirror telling the video. She's like, so I got misgendered at work today. And, you know, I'm spiraling. spiraling. You're smiling when you're saying spiraling because you're very excited about it. And you are literally so delusional that you think anyone's calling you anything other than she as you're primping your hair, telling them a story about how someone said something that hurt your feelings on some true woman behavior shit, right? And that's how you know she's not really trans, by the way, that she would even walk out of work in a panic over getting misgendered, even if she was really trans, and then talk about it on the internet. Because when you're really trans, one thing I will say, I, I wanna give, I wanna give those, those true trans, those transsexuals, those, those people who are really suffering with gender dysphoria and really out here, doing their big one every day, going to work, work, you know, trying to just figure it out, right? I will say about y'all, 
Y'all are resi resilient as hell. You have that inner strength, that inner peace to put up with the BS that you do put up with. I'm not someone who walks through life and gets misgender. Y'all think you're doing your big one on Twitter saying he for Blair White. Let me know when someone ever does that in real life, right? So I don't necessarily experience that pain that real a real transsexual who's really trying is still going to get called he would feel. But I know for damn sure, for her to still be around kicking, she's not breaking down because of it, not going to work because of it, not refusing to wake up, put her pants on one leg at a time and walk this world like everyone else has a right to, right? Because they have that resilience because they've really been through shit and you're just a clout chaser, an appropriator, right? That's how you know more than anything else. This is not a trans person. Next. This is a special PSA for anyone who's raising a white daughter. Please stop gassing your white daughters up to be mothers. Stop telling them that it is their destiny and their birthright to one day be a mother. That they will one day be a parent. If they want to, cool, but stop making them feel like that's their birthright because they often grow up feeling entitled to children. Okay. You know, I've never in my spare time looked up the definition of birthright, <laughs> but I would assume it has a little something to do with something that you were able to do specifically because of the way that you were born, right? So as a woman, I would say that giving birth, the thing that only women can do, it's birthright. God bless all the women struggle with, struggling with infertility. But you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, that's like the definition of a birthright. I actually can't imagine more of a birthright. Especially coming from the people who say things like trans women and women's sports, participating in sports is a birthright. Nuts. Also, for you to be so sick to reduce that to just white people, as if you're not just casually throwing out there which you know race you want to breed less, Oh yeah, but don't worry, black people can't be racist. Despite making a video about another race telling them to stop breeding and to stop telling their children to breed. <laughs> I mean, you are racist as shit, right? I mean, wow. I thought Blossom was bad. I genuinely think not even that race-obsessed Blossom would say this. And... <laughs> The background noise of all of this that makes it so much more demented is this is a teacher in a classroom teaching kids. I mean, I can't. All right, y'all know what time it is. It's time for more non-binary linguistics. Cause let's be real, we in a different class than y'all and I'm still not doing math. All right, come into class, don't be late. So to start today, we'll be talking about some gender neutral synonyms that you could add to your vocabulary. Instead of saying phrases like ladies and gentlemen or boys and girls, try saying phrases like distinguished guests or beautiful people. Hell, Halloween coming up. You can even say goblins and ghoulies and it would still be inclusive to all genders. All right, this one is for all my Spanish speaking bilingual baddies out there. The Spanish language is traditionally a gendered language, like many, no shade. The gender neutral conjugation in the Spanish language is ending words in an E. So with a word like nosotros or nosotras, you would end it in an E and say nosotres, and that would make it gender neutral. Do you notice how I was smiling through most of this guy's video? It's because he's funny and I want to like him. But what I don't like, is the there's something off right and what's off is that confidence that really isn't confidence because for you to actually be a confident person who's really up here with that full intensity and that humor you would have to love yourself and i'm not saying you don't love yourself in some ways but there's something you need to look deeper in yourself with why you can't just accept being what you are which is an effeminate gay man that's what you are. You're not non-binary. You're not under the trans umbrella. You know, there's a lot of shame that effeminate gay men feel over being that. And I think it can cause some of them to reach for other words. Call me anything but that. I'm non-binary. I'm a third gender. I'm a fourth gender. Because being an effeminate gay man is so stigmatized, even in the LGBT community, by the way. Know that. That's real. So it's a shield you're putting on to... Get in between those bullets of people that are going to judge you for being an effeminate gay man. But I love you for being an effeminate gay man. 
because it's real. That's what's real. That non-binary shit is not. It's not real, babe. And it's blocking you from that full self-love. Because you have enough self-love to come up on camera. You're giving, you know, a look. I wouldn't do that look, but it's a look in your own head, which means that you put love into it, right? You are funny. You're willing to put yourself out there in a way that's widely viewed. And so there's some level of self-love, but it doesn't quite extend to just accepting exactly what you are. Blair, you're being hypocritical. You didn't accept the fact that you're male. I'm male. I'm a man. I have no problem accepting that. I also have a medical condition that led me to do some other things to my body. But I am accepting of that, like all of it. Don't try me. But you know, for him, it has to be anything other than just being a sassy gay man. And I love gay men like that. I know a lot of people, even people who are like kind of okay with gay people, they're kind of like, you know, why is he putting on that voice? Really? You think it's the humor aspect? Yeah. There's clearly something biological going on. People have gay face. You can see it. I see it. I can clock someone by actually just by a picture, by seeing their face. I can tell if they're on the scale of straight and gay. And I'm actually getting so good at it, I can actually clock if they're like more on the bi level. There's bi face. I swear to God, there is. I'm not crazy. And on a deeper level, I'm gonna give that shout out to the tranny chasers now. I know you're waiting for it. The tranny chasers are watching it being like, what about us? I know. I can see you too. Just from a picture, I'm not kidding. I actually can tell a trans attractive man by a picture. There's something physiological. I can't put my finger on it. I'm still learning why, but it's there. Sexual orientation. I'm not one of these people that thinks that it's always 100% prenatal or biological, but it's clearly mostly, and you can see it. So not to get off on a tangent here, the point is, you know, shout out to the gays because I actually do love the gays when they're, real and rational and don't support things that don't make sense simply for the sake of fitting in because in my head when i think of like what makes lgbt people cool real ones are the fact that they are hyper individualistic they're living their own fucking life doing their own fucking thing and they don't give a fuck what you think it's these ones that really give a fuck that have to turn being a funny sassy effeminate gay man into this preachy shit about being trans and non-binary and use these pronouns now you're getting into that weirdo preachy shit when you could have just been funny. I had a smile on my face for half the video and then you started talking that psycho babble and I said, okay, I would frown, but I have too much Botox. Um, the point is, get it together because you can do better and I'm not trying to be mean. I want you to love yourself and I want you to view you in the way that I view you, which is as a vibrant person who lit up the screen and made me smile, but then that would be frown if I didn't have so much Botox came out over that psycho babble commie shit. No. Stop the psycho babble commie shit. Listen, that is it for this edition of the Blair White Project. I am going to go rest because I'm all stressed out. You saw me rubbing my shoulder the whole time. I'm getting knots. I'm not kidding. In fact, you might be able to hear it. That's us not from stress. I'm not kidding. Y'all are killing me.